and the word became flesh who was um, his sanctifier because we're all sanctified and saved by Jesus, those from the Old Testament, by looking forward with faith to the event which would to come, be to come, and those of us who are looking back by faith at the event after it, all of us are all saved based by faith on that one historical action of Jesus Christ. So I would think, and to make that answer short, yes, the church teaches that John the Baptist was sanctified from his mother's womb, and I would think that would be the perfect time for that to have happened is when he met the Messiah. He'd be three, uh, six months old at that point. Okay, wonderful. Julie, there's the answer to your question. Going to St. Elizabeth, Sister Christine Marie out in California asks, did Mary also go to see Elizabeth so that Jesus could make John pure in the womb of Elizabeth? These are kind of tied together. I would think that that would be a perfect um, speculation about that, that Mary went there. I think there was probably a lot of reasons Mary went there. I think she went there to get out of town for a while. Um, to have time to figure out how to handle this situation with, a, with no confusion and people rumoring about her. I think she went there to get coaching, maybe for a retreat. I think she also went there for that reason, for that very confrontation between Jesus and John, for that moment when John would recognize him. I think Mary also went so that the story of the visitation would be written so that all of us would understand who and what she is. So I think there's everything I find in Catholic teaching and scriptures, like a diamond, it has many facets, and you can look at it, and everyone has a different glow and a different light color and shade reflecting off of it. So when you meditate, that's why the beauties of the rosary is their meditations on the life of Christ. So you could take just the visitation, and look what we've just discussed here in a short time. Think about if you really meditated on that for a year, for example, every day for a year, even now, just now, that, that Mary went there so that John could be sanctified in his mother's womb, so that maybe Elizabeth was uh, also had a sanctification of some sort in her womb as well. And it also, it just the effect that she would have on them. One funny, one interesting thing I, I didn't get to say, when, Mar when the angel said to Mary, um, you're going to give birth to a son, and it's a miraculous birth. And Mary said, well, how will this be? And the angel blessed her. But earlier, the angel had come to Zechariah and said, you're going to have a son. And Zechariah said, how will this be? And God punished him. He couldn't, he couldn't speak for till the baby was born. Doesn't that seem a little unfair? Well, I think it's because in the Bible, when you read it, you don't see the facial expressions or the tone of voice. I think when he said to Zechariah, uh, you're going to give birth to a son. And Zechariah said, oh, yeah, really? Have you seen Elizabeth lately? Uh, how's that going to happen? So he was punished for not believing. Mary said, how will that be? I am ready to do it and cooperate with you if you'll let me know how that will be. So God blessed her by that. But I think in the visitation, we have a lot of things going on all at once. John the Baptist being sanctified, the story being written so we understand Mary is the Ark of the New Covenant. It also gives her an opportunity to sing that wonderful Magnificat that we now sing every day in, in the hours and so on. So I hope that helps a little. Okay, wonderful. Thank you, Steve. Nanette in, I'm not sure, no, Nanette is in Silverton, Oregon. She asks, why the Jewish people don't accept Jesus since he fulfills the Toda is what she writes. Um, and she's also interested in the book that you showed us with the beautiful imagery. But what about the Jewish people not accepting Jesus? There's a, a number of ways to deal with that. Let's deal with it just from the biblical perspective. If I were a Jew at the time of Jesus, and remember that Jews are from the tribe of Judah. The northern 10 tribes disappeared in 761. The Syrians took them. We have no idea where they are. So the last tribe left was Judah. And from that, we get the word Jew. So the Jews, if I were one back then, and you said to me, see that guy walking toward us right here, that's Jesus, and he is the second person of the Trinity, and he is God in the flesh. My first reaction would be, you are insane, because the Old Testament says that God is not a man, God cannot be seen by anybody, he couldn't even reveal himself to Moses, he said it only, he turned his backside, and he only saw a, a, a glance of him as going by. God is spirit, God is not a man, something that you can see. So it's not possible for that guy right there to be divine, which was why it was such a contentious issue that Jesus came down. And when John says, in the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the, word and the word became flesh, the word was God, that was a very radical statement. So from the very standpoint 
of the Jews having this concept of God being invisible, that he's not a man, then how could that be him? So that was a real problem for them at that point, I think. And when Stephen gave his talk in, in chapter six and seven, he concludes by saying, I see the one, the son of man seated at the right hand of the glory and high. That was all they could take. How in the world could that man be in heaven and be God? That was just too much. Now we also know from Paul in chapters nine, 10 and 11 of Romans that God blinded the eyes of the Jews so that the gospel that could then go to us Gentiles. That's a great mystery. Those passages of Paul have been discussed over and over and a lot. But I think that we could view that as that God, when the Jewish people, not all of the Jews rejected him. Remember, even in the book of Acts, it says that many of the priests became faithful. And remember, all of the disciples were Jews. The only believers for the first five to 10 years were Jews. Those who came to Christ at Pentecost and were baptized were only Jews. So many Jews did believe. All the day of Pentecost was only Jews. The first Gentile is Cornelius. And that maybe have been five years later. We don't know how long, five or eight years later. It's, it's, it doesn't give us dates. But he was the first Gentile. And then when the Gentiles in Antioch started to believe in Christ, it became a big thing. You can't, you you can't do that, Gentiles. You have to be circumcised and become Jews first. So originally it was only Jews. So a lot of Jews did believe. But then we hear Paul say that he blinded the eyes of the Jews so that then the gospel would go out to the Gentiles. That's a great mystery, but I think that plays into it. So there's two. One is that the Jews had a hard time comprehending and accepting that this guy was God, and they didn't want that kind of a Messiah. They wanted a Messiah that came in on a white horse with a sword, and they kick Rome out. Even the day of Jesus's ascension into heaven, what does he, they say to him? Is it now time to reconstitute Israel? They still didn't get it. They thought that Jesus was now getting a guy, white horse, get a sword, go and chase the Romans out of Jerusalem. We're going to have uh, our Israel under God again. But th the Jews didn't understand that the Messiah, Jesus is coming twice. Once as the suffering servant and one is the victorious. They were waiting for the victorious. And when Jesus hung on a cross, which is the worst thing you could do, the Jews just couldn't, they couldn't swallow that. Steve Ray is with us as we have an amazing Monday morning. Steve, I've got a couple more questions. This okay. is coming from Connie out in Springfield, Ohio. And Connie asks, and I, I've been interested about this too, who would have been in charge of raising the children in the temple? Were there many of these children? And was this a normal practice as we hear about some of these children being raised in the temple like Mary? There's not a lot of evidence about that. There's not a lot written about that. We know, for example, that Samuel, the little boy, worked, lived in the temple with Eli, the priest, and that's where, and he lived in the presence of the Ark of the Covenant there. And, um, and so, in fact, my son named his, it was the year of the Eucharist, when one of my second, uh, my son Jesse had his second son, it was the year of the Eucharist. So he named him Samuel because Samuel was living in the presence of the Eucharist and the boy's name, uh, the presence of the Ark and the, co the Covenant. And then his middle name was Tarsisius because that is a New Testament saint who defended the Eucharist and saved it from the Romans. So he named him Samuel Tarsisius. But the question is that Samuel was taken into the temple, and we know that he served Eli, the priest there, as a young boy. It doesn't tell us all that he did, but we do know that when he fell asleep at night, he heard, Samuel, Samuel, and he came to Eli, and he said, what do you want? It wasn't me. I didn't call you. Go back to bed. Samuel, Samuel, it was the Lord calling him. He got up and went back. Eli, what did you want? And he said, I, don't, I didn't call you, son. This time when you go back, it must be God. So when you hear your name called, say, here I am. Your servant is listening. So then God gave Samuel that message. We know that he lived in the temple as a young child. So we can get an idea from that. But I don't know myself. There may be uh, other literature that explains what a child did in the temple. Although I know that there was a lot to be done because they had all these costly garments that had to be sewn. There was a lot of uh, food preparation. They, it was like a huge warehouse too. But um, that's the best I can do on that question. I'm not sure. 
That's great. That's great, Steve. Thank you. There is a question, and this goes back to your first talk this morning, Steve, on defending the Eucharist. And this is from Elizabeth up in British Columbia at Saint at Pope Pius X Parish, which is the home of Father John Horgan. She asks, can you explain what the Eucharist does for us, how it empowers us spiritually? We have been taught the Eucharist divinizes us. Well, it says in Second uh, Peter, it says that the great that we are partakers of the divine nature by the great promises that He's given to us. And I think promises there don't just mean a verbal promise, like I'll do something for you, but the sacraments are oaths, promises or oaths that God has made to us. And so when the way I like to think it of it, when I was raised, my mom told me to eat good food. She said, because you are what you eat. And sometimes I call that talk, um, defending the Eucharist, you are what you eat, that we become Jesus in a sense, that when we eat him, we are digesting him into our body and we become partakers of the divine nature. And it's, and it's his, his uh, very food and, um, nutrition so to speak that comes into us and makes us more like him and this is why we should always avoid profane things because when we get involved with profane things they corrupt us but when we stay close to christ and with the sacred things and we partake of him that becomes for us the fathers of the church said it was a uh, the food of immortality the food of salvation and the medicine of immortality how it all works, I don't know. But one of the things I do know is that you need digestive juices for it. That may sound strange, but let me explain. When I'm done here for this, I'm going to have an hour before I give my conversion story. I'm going to eat something. And when I eat it, it's going to go down into my stomach. And there are amino acids and proteins and digestive juices and stomach acids and things that are going to take that food that I eat. And it's going to break it down and distribute it through my body so it brings health and healing and maturity and growth and all those things to my body. I need digestive juices to digest and make that food work in my life. I think that the sacraments like the Eucharist also need digestive juices. And I think that digestive juice is faith. That's why when we come up to the Eucharist and he, the priest puts it on our tongue or we take it and put it on our tongue, we say, amen, body of Christ, amen. In other words, I believe it. And that's faith. And with faith, the sacraments work. I'm not making the point that sacraments, don't, sacraments work because they are what they are and they do what they do. But if I, for example, if I get baptized when I, I'm, I, I'm 20 years old, say, and I take a bath, that doesn't mean I'm baptized. I get wet. If somebody even says in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, it pours it on me, and my, the words out of my mouth are, I don't believe it, that didn't work. I didn't have faith. S baptism is a sacrament of faith, and it takes faith with those words and that water to have it effective in our life. And I think when we take the Eucharist, when we say amen, it's a way of saying, so be it. I believe. I remember when I was a first Catholic, one of the first times I went up, I was so excited. I was crying. I cried at every mass for the first six years. And usually it would be when I went up for the Eucharist. And I remember one time the priest said, body of Christ. And I was so excited. I was crying. I said, thank you. <laughs> but it, it was, I think that that would explain it, that when we do that, it's like the, there's a, the faith that we have. And some Catholics say, well, I've been taking the Eucharist my whole life. It never changed my life. It never, I never felt any different. Well, I'll tell you, and so will a lot of converts, that without the, without the sacraments, and this is confession and the Eucharist, there were sins we could never get victory over. But after becoming Catholics, I will tell you that I've had victory over sins in my life that I would have never dreamed I could have as a Protestant. And I fully attribute that to the fact that I am taking part of the sacraments. And I really, really believe that when I take, sometimes I say, Lord, this tastes like bread, but I know it's your body. I, by faith, you said it is, and I know it is. And I pray that it'll have all the effect of that in my life and in my being. And it's the same, I think that that faith is what really makes it work. It's like the digestive juices and it heals us. It makes us holy. It gives us food for immortality. It's the food for the journey. It's all those things that we need. Jesus is giving him himself. And by that, we become part takers of the divine nature as well. I'm Amen. sorry that was so long. <laughs> That's awesome. 
We have time for one more question and uh, people might be able to see Sister Anne Marie is getting ready in the chapel. But just as we close here, Steve, and I know you've got many grandchildren, you, you and Janet have raised children. We've got a woman who's working in faith formation in her parish with children. And she asks, how do we share these truths with these young five to 10 year olds so that it can understand? Is there, are there programs? Are there ways that you can encourage parents and faith formation instructors to teach these to the young people? Um, I, I was kind of radical. I don't, I don't know about programs or books or lessons, those kind of things. I did radical things with our kids to teach them things like that because I, you know, we're competing today against video games and iPhones and computer programs and fast paced television and commercials. And it's very difficult to relay the faith when we're competing against those things. So I would say the first thing is for families to get rid of the television. I did not have a television when I was a kid and I did not have television for my kids and all of my grandkids are being raised without television or the gadgets. They don't own their own iPhones and things. They have computers in the living room and they watch movies together. They do everything together as a family, but they don't go off in their rooms with their little gadgets and they don't have television that they have normal television. It's all just movies that they watch as a family. So I'd say, first of all, get rid of that because it's hard to compete against that. But you have to be creative with your kids. I'm going to tell a real quick story of how even for confirmation, a boy wanted me to be his confirmation sponsor. And I told him no, because I travel too much. I can't do it. So the mother said, well, would you do me a favor and meet with him just for one evening? And I said, I can do that. I'll bring him over for two hours. I'll spend with this boy. But I wanted that boy to know, I wanted to do something that just that boy was not prepared for and something he'd never forget. And I wanted him to meet, know what it really meant to be confirmed. So when he came over, when I knew he was on his way, I have a big sword. I've used it in my movies. It's three and a half foot sword, double edged. It's a real deal. I could take a horse's head off with that and I swung it hard enough. And then I had a Roman helmet that I had that I used in the movie. So I went downstairs. I got that Roman helmet on. I got that sword and I put it in the scabbard and my wife pinned a red blanket over my shoulder. And I looked just like a Roman centurion. And I hid in the shadows of my porch. And when that kid came up the sidewalk, I knew that he was thinking, I gotta go. I would listen to that bald headed guy for an hour or two, you know, but he had no idea it was going to happen because when he got to the top of the steps, I pulled that sword out. I jumped out and I pushed that kid against the wall with a sword. And I said, Matthew, are you ready to die for Jesus Christ right now? If not, you're not ready to be confirmed. I'm a busy man and I don't have time to waste for you. If you're not ready to die for Jesus Christ, are you Matthew? And he goes, I, I will, I can, I do. And then I brought him into the house and I spent two hours with that boy teaching him what it meant to be confirmed, that you have to be ready to die for Jesus Christ. And if you're not ready to take the sword in the throat right now, boy, don't tell me you're ready. Because the Jews, they get bar mitzvah, the boys, and they go out in the streets and they say, I'm proud to be Jewish and I'll die for the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And that's what confirmation is. It's where our kids take the step where now I'm an adult Catholic. I'm ready to die for the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And if I walk out of the church on my confirmation and I die for Jesus, so be it. And we need to we need to do drastic things to impress kids like this because if we don't, they, they just think it's a party. They don't understand the reality of it. They need to know the biblical verses. They need to know what it really means. And, and I, I've done a lot of those kind of stories. I could talk for an hour about all those things I've done with kids. I remember once going into a class of CCD and they didn't know who I was. So I told them that I was an atheist professor from the University of Michigan. And I said, I got to sneak in here. They think I'm a Christian, but I'm really an atheist. And they asked me to come in and talk to you kids. So how many of you are Christians? And they raised their hand. And I said, oh, that's terrible. How many are Catholics? Oh, that's even worse. We got to fix that. And I gave them a 20-minute a, a, a lecture on why they should be uh, um, atheists. And then I asked for questions. And the kids there just wanted to kill me. Well, haven't you ever experienced God's love or joy in your life? I said, well, I did once, but it was after a glass of wine. So I really don't know if it was God or, and they wanted to kill me. And then I had 20 minutes left. And I said, kids, let me tell you who I really am. I'm Steve Ray and I'm a convert to the Catholic church. And now let me teach you how to really prove that God exists. And I went and spent a whole time teaching them the difference between atheism and secularism and Christianity. And I had those kids sitting on the edge of their seat, ready to kill me. But if we don't get their attention, all the books and programs aren't going to work. 
Absolutely. By the way, I admire people who take the task because teaching kids today, it's got to be one of the hardest jobs there is, maybe even harder than being a bishop. I don't know, but it's got to be one of the hardest jobs. And I got to hand it to any parents or teachers who do those kind of things. God bless you for it. 